a group of kids that were kind of abused and neglected in our local community. And it was getting close to Christmas. It was about August. And, and she said, there's really not a lot of toys for these kids. going to be a bunch of toothbrushes going to these kids around Christmas time. And I said, there's got to be something someone could do for this. And, and she said, well, you know, really there's not. And so I got together with myself and a couple other people and I said, yeah, let's do a concert and call it Toys for Tykes Country Jam. And so uh, we worked on it for about three three months, and we ended up raising. We did a concert downtown on our square back then. This is probably about eleven years ago, and and uh, we raised enough toys to give about three hundred and fifty kids Christmas that year, and it, it just kind of grew from there. And we and when I got off stage. It was the first time I'd performed in front of people in a while. I'd been doing some acting, to be honest, for about three or four years, and and uh, as a paid theater actor and. And I got off stage and somebody goes, man, you got something. You should really keep going. And and uh, about a week later, I got a phone call from somebody and said, hey, we'd love to pay you to come play a gig at our place. And that's kind of the rest is history. you know. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, between, between what you got going for yourself, your talent, your enthusiasm, your music, and hanging around with the Bellamy Brothers is one of two things going to happen. You're either... You're either going to make it, or you're going to be in deep trouble because those guys, those guys are just too much fun. I uh, I got to uh, got to hang with them a few uh, for a little bit back when they were here. Oh, I don't know what was it, five or six months ago they were in town, and I got to hang with them for a little bit after the show. And uh, they are they're just too much, and the the families, the crew, the whole bunch. Even Wally, unfortunately, Wally isn't able to travel with them anymore because of. Uh, I think he had some back problems or something, but uh, we keep in touch with him too. And uh, just a great bunch of guys all around. It's it's like family. Everybody's a Bellamy. But uh, today we're talking about everybody's a Wooten. And uh, uh, John Bon Jovi, you look like you have a question for uh, Rootin Tootin Shane Wooten here. No, that's just uh, that's just the, the the look I always have on my face. You know, one of confusion. Now, uh, Shane, uh, first of all, uh, you know, and I say this with all sincerity. Congratulations uh, on Mudslinger. I mean, that's uh, that's really nice. Uh, good good song. I, I'll tell you what I like about it. Uh, it has a, an old school analog feel to it. And uh, it's also it, the the first impression that I had was it reminded me I went to the University of South Florida, graduated back in the early 70s, and there was a, a bar up in Lutz, uh, just north of Fowler Avenue in Tampa, and it was called the Losers Lounge. It was uh, the, really the only reason you went. To, to go there was to pick up chicks and get drunk because and maybe throw up on the floor well, because you were a loser <laughs> but but this kind of music mudslinger that genre of music is what you heard on the jukebox and everybody was boogieing to it and you know tapping their toes and having a good time and laughing and and so that's what i like about this song that's that was the immediate memory that came back to me as soon as I heard this. And I don't know if that's what you were going for. And if it is, man, you nailed it. Yeah. You know, we, we were looking at some stuff like that and I grew up, I grew up about an hour and a half from Tampa, but I lived in Barris Avenue and I, I know right where you're talking about there off of Fowler and uh, Fletcher exactly. area. Um, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we, I used to run around down there a little bit and cause some trouble in my younger days as well. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, we were looking for that. We were looking for that great feel. Uh, you know, we, we recorded it on modern equipment, but we wanted it to have that really warm analog feel that you hear there. Um, you know, just kind of warms it up to the speakers. And a lot of music today, uh, you know, a lot of people track it out and it's digital and it just feels really cold. But, um, you know, working with, with a lot of great musicians over the years, you really start to really start to feel the difference between the two. Um, well, brother, you nailed so we, it. You, you really did. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, I'll let my buddies over in Pelham, Alabama, know as well because uh, that's that's what they were shooting for too. Was kind of give it that, you know. I said I, when I came in the studio, they said, "What's your reference material that you kind of feeling?" And I said, "Man, I want something like, I want something Skinnerd and a little bit of Guns N' Roses and a little bit of Jason Aldean. Let's just throw it all in that bucket and stir it up and kind of start working from there." So that it was. And it seems to me also that you you know you you got a good Hank Jr. Uh, influence in there going as well, and uh, that, that was kind of cool. 
Yeah, we you know we we threw we threw a lot of stuff in there, and being being right by Gainesville here, growing up, uh, one of the things an engineer said when we were working on the song is he looked up and he goes, "Man, I hear a little bit of um, Tom Petty in this too, uh, and a couple of your lines that you do." And and so we we thought that was really cool, and unfortunately, uh, Tom passed, but. When I put out the song, I'd thrown out a couple of tweets and uh, about it and kind of tagged him in there about it. And uh, he came back and hit me up and, and said that he'd given the song a listen. And that was really cool. Uh, oh. But uh, that, was, that was a few years ago, so it was, it was neat. Boy, this oh, is all bringing back it. some memories. Bringing back yeah, some memories is. for me, too, because I, uh, I spent several years in the Tampa market in radio there. And uh, during my country stint, I was also in rock in Tampa. But during my country stint, uh, there was a club. I can't remember the name of it anymore, but if you were a uh, if you were a country star, you played this one club, and uh, we used to hang there. And I, I was just I was just picturing you doing this to that audience there, and you'd probably tear the house apart. I remember we went in there one time. A uh, quick little anecdote: I won't mention the uh, the artist's name for reasons that will be obvious, but we went in there, and uh, he had a show. And he came over and he sat with us and was talking, and he said. Uh, Hey, uh, before you guys order, wait up for me for a minute. And he disappeared out the door. And we're sitting there saying, you know, what the heck's going on? He came back and (laughs) he came back and opened up his jacket, pulled out a bottle and set it on the table. And he says, just order your mixer. His drinks are too damned expensive. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, those uh, those great old days. And as a matter of fact, I I spent some time up in Gainesville, too. I was at... uh, the old WGGG there, the rock station. That was back whoo, long ago in a galaxy far away. But anyway, we're here to talk about Shane Wooten. We got you up to where you are now, and uh, you're slinging some mud and some and some good country music. What's in the immediate future for you, Shane? So right now I'm just working on a couple new songs in the studio, um, looking at some some other stuff. We want to kind of come behind Mudslinger with a song that we've been doing out on tour for about five years called You've Got Something I Want. And we went in the studio and started working on it, and it's not finished yet, but it's uh, it's getting there. It's getting close. And so we're going to come up behind uh, Mudslinger with, with You've Got Something I Want to really follow up with kind of that rock country feel. Um, and We've got a good time. We're looking at doing some touring around around the uh, Florida area and the Keys down there, maybe some of the island areas with uh, my old hit song "Shovel and Sunshine," which has gotten a lot of gotten me a lot of good uh, good mileage and still a still a perennial favorite when we're out on tour and the fans still love it. So it's uh, and it's getting really dangerously close. It's threatening to to get me a gold uh, a gold video on YouTube. I guess they've got a uh, a thing now they don't have gold records uh, like they used to. I mean they still do, but you can also get a gold video as well. And so I'm um, keeping gonna, my eye on the ticker for that too. Yeah. Well, we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to get to work there and see if we can uh, see if we can do any damage to help you uh, trip over that gold there somewhere. You have to keep in touch with us on that. Let us know. Uh, also, I, I want to mention you're, you're talking about uh, your next release. I hope you get us on the uh, release list for that so that uh, we can play the thing and. Uh, maybe help you get it kicked off up there. You got any idea when that's going to be out? Uh, yeah, we should have it out. Um, hopefully we'll release it later this year. So I'll keep you tuned in as uh, usually what happens is we, you know, we cut it and then we, we do it in the studio and then we give it to the engineers and they just start working on it. And, and uh, we, we always have a joke, uh, actually a guy had mentioned to me, an older engineer, he said, man, the song's never done. It's just released. <laughs> and so we, uh, yeah, well, you're about right. You know, we, That's about right. Yeah. And the the the, uh, the refreshing thing is when you do it live, you get that feel. And uh, uh, there's a uh, I, I've noticed there's a there's a line between where being true to the original recording crosses over to injecting the spontaneity of doing it live. And to me. That's a real trick, being able to do it so that you you don't lose the feel of the original recording, because let's face it, that's what most of your listeners first hear, but yet injecting that spontaneity, that life where you can you can really get into a relationship with a live audience. And uh, uh, Mudslinger is going to do it. There's no question about that. And I'm really looking forward uh, to that uh, to the next song and what you're going to do with that. Tell us a little bit about how you got 
uh, hooked up with the Bellamy's. So I was recording a um, a radio program on WTRF 102.3 FM down here, and uh, basically I'd done a show, and I'd opened for uh, this this is a while back. I'd opened for Josh Grayson, and and I, I walked outside, and the radio DJ said, "Hey man, I I hear all this amazing things from people walking out here." And, you know, I want to talk to you. So they did a radio interview with me. One thing led to another. And he said, he said, uh, you know, hey, cut me a cut me a promo uh, for my uh, for my show. If you want, do a little jingle. And so I went in the in the recording studio over at the radio station there with my guitar player, Nick. And Nick and I laid down something and he started playing it on his show. And before I knew it, the radio station contacted me and said, hey, how would you like to, you know, do kind of a celebrity uh, mus- musician show and you can play whoever you want and so the first people I, l- I thought about calling was the Bellamy Brothers because I'd grown up listening to their music and being Florida guys too I wanted to have them on the show and so I called down uh, down to their place and I talked to one of the gals that works for them and I said hey you know I'd like to talk with the Bellamy's my name's Shane Wooten and I left my number and I got a call back about a week later and they set up the interview and said you know Howard will do about 15 minutes with you and we got on the phone and started talking like old boys do, and and before I before I knew it, we talked for an hour and a half, and uh, <laughs> Howard and I just, yep. you know, we we just hit it off, and you know he he's a great guy, and so is David, and you know I've just come to really love the whole the whole crew, like you said, the family, Randy and and Wally and and all of them, and and uh, we just, you know, we 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 started uh, connecting and and working together on some projects and. Uh, and one day I was down at the ranch and, and David said, Hey Shane, I, I got a, a stack of songs over there. Go pick out four and, uh, and we'll do them with you. And I said, what, you know? And he said, yeah, man, let's, let's do it. And and so it was, it was really cool. So I got to work on their old uh, analog board that they have and, the, uh, and I awesome. got to record. Nice. nice. Yeah, well, got- you know, the, the, the Bellamy's at least to me, you know, they're, I mean, in, in addition to being supremely talented, uh, they're just kind of the quintessential definition of good old boys. I mean, just, hey, let's have some fun. Let's play some music. Let's drink some beer. Let's chase some women. Let's just have a good old time. And now, of course, I know they're happily married family men, but that genre, that, you know, that, that uh, je ne sais quoi, if you will, is always there. Um, so uh, what you're telling us uh you know, it, it it's pleasing to hear, but not surprising because we've known the Bellamy's for a long time, and they've, as David said, you know, they've been on our show oh, probably what about a half dozen times now. Yeah, I got and, chased uh, by their old old uh, Longhorn steer Randy <laughs> one time back in the uh, oh god, that must have been twenty years ago, and <laughs> went over. I was outside the ranch looking in the fence, and I went over. Uh, Went over to get a closer look and maybe a picture of him because he had a, he had a monstrous uh, set of horns on him. And he took one look at me and started charging the fence. And uh, I left very quickly. <laughs> time, to, <laughs> time to back off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, So what do you got planned with long range? You know, we know you're going to do some touring. Uh, you mentioned Florida. So I hope you at least get down uh, maybe uh, – Naples Fort Myers way so that uh, John Bon Jovi can catch you out. And uh, if you happen to get out uh, Tempe University of, uh, or uh, rather Arizona State University out that way, uh, give me a holler because I'm just down the road from the, uh, from the university there. But uh, you've got the touring coming up. You're working on some new music. What's your long range plan? You know, I never plan too, too far ahead. Uh, one thing I've learned in, uh, doing the technology business and as, and also with um with the musician you know the music stuff is that if you plan too far ahead you kind of find yourself working towards something uh and and putting blinders on and and you you start to lose track of what your fans are trying to tell you and so a lot of times what I do is I I plan out a little bit and then I just go out and and run what I call sprints and so I'll run a few weeks or a few months and just really start looking for the feedback from the fans and what they're telling me they want. And I try to develop whatever experience they're looking for. You know, that's really what I go for. So I guess my long-term plan is just to continue to, to listen to the fans and try and create better and better experiences that, uh, that, be, you know, that they, that they enjoy and, and, and drive them to come see me and listen to my music online and stuff like that. So. 
That's a very good answer. I, I really, uh, I like that. I'm impressed with that answer. It's a, a well thought out answer. And I, 